Hi, I'm Dylan Taylor, Chairman and CEO of Voyager Space Holdings. I'm Ken Eppins, Founder and CEO of Orbit Guardians. Hi, I'm Raphael Rodkin, Founder of E2MC Space Ventures. And I listen to the Cold Star Project. And I listen to the Cold Star Project. And I listen to the Cold Star Project. This show is for entertainment purposes only and is not what is termed professional advice. The Cold Star Project is proudly presented by the Operational Excellence Society. Cold Star Tech is a supporter of the OPEX Society, and Jason Canigan is a member of its board of advisors. Talk with us at Cold Star Tech to find out what we can achieve together with your Lean Six Sigma or Operational Excellence programs. And check out opexsociety.org to learn more. Super excited to have Joseph Paris, founder of the Operational Excellence Society, hands on a tech. That's the name of the company. Uh, back on. It's been a little while. I first ran into Joseph because of his excellent book on operational excellence called State of Readiness, which is the best book on OPEX I'd read in 20 years. Uh, brought OPEX up to the level of strategy instead of logistics or a tactical perspective. So Joseph and I met just after the Christmas break and he had something new to show me about visualization and um, problem solving and getting the team on board on projects to get something done. And the cool thing is you didn't need any special training to use this thing. So I immediately thought, oh my gosh, (laughs) the world needs to see more of this. And so I invited him to come on and share this thing with us so that you can see it. And so if you like what you see, get a hold of me to talk about it because you could be using this thing uh, right away. So Joseph, welcome. You have developed a new tool. Uh, Actually, somebody developed it with you. And uh, I want you to tell me about it because we ran through this and I was instantly struck by the utility of it, how effective it was, um, the fact that you didn't need any special training to be able to use it. And yet it's, it's also physically impactful. So... Uh, welcome back and, and tell us a little bit about what this is, what you call it, who it's for, what it does. All right. Well, it's a, yeah. a checklist there, isn't it? <laughs> um, and by the way, thanks for having me back. It's been a You're while right. since mm-hmm. uh, since uh, our first session, which is you know, a few years ago. Yeah. But uh, the, the approach, the methodology is called uh, design thinking for operational excellence. And uh, what what struck me uh, was uh, how easy it was for people to engage. You know, I, I'm a consultant. That's what I do. You know, I have cons- some couple of consulting firms. And one of the challenges I always face is getting people into a room, having them collaborate uh, in some meaningful manner, and ending the day with a decision. And that decision can't be to have another meeting. Hmm. on it you know what i mean uh, my ideal scenario is to like have a challenge get people together and at the end of the day we've made a decision uh so uh design thinking is uh is nothing new uh there's a couple of different ways of going about it the the approach uh i take is uh, a, an approach called billboard design thinking and the reason it's called billboard design thinking is because the uh, game board that's created, which I'll I'll show a couple of them, but the game board that's created is about 90 centimeters tall or three feet tall. And it could be, um, you know, I think the longest one I have is like 24 feet wide. Okay, so it's a big imposing uh, billboard that people engage. And there's a lot of psychology that's going on uh, that I found fascinating. Uh, one of the uh, uh, things that I noticed is that everybody's standing and facing the poster. So mm-hmm. it's almost like they're united against a common enemy, all right, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to sitting around a conference table where the problem is in the middle, but people are uh, in the crossfire. They're talking mm-hmm. over the problem, not at the problem. So it was really kind of fascinating that uh, the psychology of it was you know, very, very collaborative, high, high level of engagement. Obviously, it also requires that you're in the same room. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have tried to deliver it remotely, you know, using Mural or Klaxoon or one of the, the, those types of, of tools. But um, <clears throat> the level of engagement drops off the cliff because mm-hmm. people are now you know, looking at their email or their phone or something like that. When they're in the room, they're all intensely concentrating at the problem at, at hand and not uh, having any distractions. 
So uh, those are some of the dynamics that I saw. I'll give you a case study uh, mm -hmm. of one of them. Uh, a client had a problem with uh, their ISO 9000 audit for vendors. Okay. Um, they had like 45 criterion for a vendor to be a vendor with the company. And they failed the audit because not a single vendor had all 45. Right. So um, uh, this was a, a problem that, that existed for about four months. I didn't know how to solve it. Hmm. So I got them in, into a room. I got a, a you know, cross representation of the company. Obviously, legal was there, procurement and supply chain quality, continuous improvement, a um, couple of other people, finance. Um, and it all started off with, uh, well, we need all 45. And uh, they, uh, and this was, you know, sp especially the people that were risk averse, uh, we need all 45. And I said, well, you know, obviously you don't because you've been in business for years and none of the vendors have all 45. Mm -hmm. So, it's, you know, it's, it, this is a, a, a false uh, uh, assumption that you need it because you don't. Uh, so we started after they got over that hurdle. Um, Again, this is a big billboard, right? You know, so we, I, I had them write all 45 of the criterion down and then rank them as to must-haves, uh, really would like to haves, like to haves, and why is this here to, in, the, in the first place? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> after a lot of debate, and there was a lot of debate because, again, people all wanted to have all 45 and the must-haves, mm -hmm. Um, we ended up with having about six must-haves. Uh, five of them dropped off. They, they couldn't figure out why they were in, there in the first place. <laughs> uh, a, a bunch of them ended up in the uh, really like-to-haves, and uh, the rest were in the like-to-haves. Mm -hmm. And what we ended up doing is the really like-to-haves were assigned two points, and the like-to-haves were assigned one point. And so not only did they have a streamlined a requirements process that was real, that was based in a reality, but they also ended up having a vendor scorecard right. with a point system. So now if like two vendors could provide the same exact uh, uh, item, the one that had the higher points was uh, the preferred one. Mm -hmm. But it also gave a path to the unpreferred ones mm -hmm. to improve their value to the customer, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. their customer. So, um, and by the way, this was all done in five hours. The whole thing what was what they had not solved in four months. We solved in five hours together. All right. Now, of course, we solved it. That didn't mean it was done because, mm -hmm. you know, legal had to update the the uh, agreements and procurement had to educate the vendors as to what was coming down the pike and prepare all of that. So, you know, it wasn't done, but the decision was made and a path forward was created for it to be done. Mm -hmm. uh and again that only took four hours five hours to, to yeah. accomplish that is that is tremendous and one of the exciting outcomes i mean i love the unexpected goodies that come out of this process right like the path to victory right for, yeah. for other suppliers or um a, a sort of a weighted decision matrix for for deciding rather than I don't know, right? You know, right. some sort of vague uh, method of decision making. So, right, right. Yeah. Right. So this this big poster goes up on the wall. People stand in front of it. They give it their mm -hmm. full attention. It gets an engagement level that you don't normally see, and everybody's on the same side instead of, uh, you know, plinking away from their particular regular vantage point. Uh, right. This is where I sit at the boardroom table, right? Which right, is, right, and just like and, the dining room table at home, folks. <laughs> well, the real, the real, you know, key too is that they don't have to learn anything mm -hmm. in order to engage. They just have to show up. I mean, so I mean, there's just no. You don't have to learn the X matrix or you know, Hoshin Connery. You don't have to, you know, which to a lay person looking at the X matrix mm -hmm. is imposing. It's like, what, what is this? How do I engage? What do I do? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, it's usually not on a game board that's on a wall. It's usually, you know, on an A4 or something like that in front of you um, or on a computer. So, it's, you know, it's it's very difficult for the layperson to actually engage in a meaningful manner because they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. OK, and then they have to learn that tool before they can contribute. And, you know, it, it just uh, slows everything down. Yeah. So, and so this, when, this is magic by comparison. Right? Yeah. Like, well, you, you, would you like to to show the audience a little oh, bit of the yeah, magic? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This is what impressed me because you know we we started talking about it last time, and uh, 
I was like, okay, I, this sounds interesting. But when I saw it, that was when it instantly made sense. So let's see. Uh, am I? Oh, yeah. Are you sorry? Yeah. And you see and, the game and, board? Yeah. And for those who are listening, because this is also an audio, uh, I will put a link in the description to some screenshots that I'll have up on the Google Drive so you can click through and see those. Okay. So, uh, this is um, uh, one of the highly used um, uh, game boards that we created. Uh, and basically, you know, a lot of times people hire me to, to uh, help stand up their OpEx or re-stand up their OpEx program. And most people actually don't know what their OpEx program is supposed to accomplish in the first place. You know, what, what, what does victory look like, if you will? Mm -hmm. And so this game board uh, is designed to um, constitute... Uh, an OpEx program from what's important and identifying what's important. Uh, and so I'll just, you know, go through it really quick. Um, first off, we start off with, you know, what does OpEx mean? What does operational excellence mean to you? And by the way, they write it down on their sticky notes. What, mm -hmm. what operational excellence means to you is on a standard post-it note. And they just write it down and they put it up in this first, uh, first section here. And then we go through a series of, of um, questions, you know, and such as uh, what's the vision of the future of your company? You know, how are we going to achieve it? Uh, one of my favorite uh, questions is this number five here. Um, you know, what are the three most important strategic initiatives you're working on? Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I like this is because if operational excellence isn't one of them, I know I can't count on that person to contribute. Right, because a, a a leader can only work on three strategic uh, initiatives at a time, um, without getting overwhelmed and without things falling off the truck. So, if if operational excellence isn't one of them from the individual, then uh, I know I can't count on that person. This is not to say it's doomed to failure, but it, what what it will uh, tell me is that it's going to take longer, since I can't rely on that person. Somebody else has got to contribute um, instead. And so uh, assuming that people have, you know, full-time jobs that are fully allocated, I know that uh, it's going to just take longer, which if, you know, my, in my analysis, my, uh, you know, experience, most of these programs don't fail. You know, people say, well, CI fails or OPEX fails 70% of the time. I, I would, I would say I've never seen an OPEX program that left things worse off. <laughs> okay you're thinking about it a little yeah at least. yeah but but what will they do fail is to meet an expectation and oftentimes that expectation isn't set mm -hmm. okay uh, or it's set with the assumption that everybody's going to con you know contribute and involved and, and that's a wrong assumption and then the last question here is you know if um uh, if you're not going to use opex how else are you going to do it that's fair enough right if you're not going to use opex to achieve these objectives what are you going to use instead? All right, that's a simple question. Mm -hmm. So, what are the lighthouse goals? What what precipitates out of this is a level of alignment. Um, that's what this, these uh, 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 scores are. We do a um, analog assessment of uh, the responses, and when I say we, the, the the group does an analog assessment of the responses to determine how aligned they are in their responses. Um, and we score that alignment in, a, in a, basically a radar diagram or spider diagram. We then uh, identify uh, what are the lighthouse goals, you know, uh, what does success look like, how do we know, and, um, and what do we want to work on. And then we rank those things from most important to least important and select three. You know, these are going to constitute what, <clears throat> what uh, is going to be given priority in our OpEx program. And it's not always co cost cutting. Like I have a client that mines and refines lithium. They don't care about cost. They only, because the entire supply or demand uh, for their supply uh, outstrips what the entire marketplace can, co you know, contribute. So what's important to them is safety, reliability, and uptime. They want their machines running all the time, making product in a consistent manner, and they want everybody to go home the same way they came in. So that's their lighthouse. Now, eventually, maybe the, the supply chain will catch up with demand and there's going to be new priorities. But, you know, it's not always about cost cutting. Now, mm -hmm. this last element here is, you know, what's your headline? Now, most people, when they're uh, um, uh, describing success, they're going to give me a long 500 word 
diatribe of what success looks like. You know, something that you know it might be geared for the Wall Street Journal or something like that, or or uh, the investors, um, <clears throat> or sometimes they just keep on babbling until they you know strike something that that fits. So this this exercise here is incredibly challenging. You know, what's your headline? So pretend, um, you know, the company's OPEX program was so wildly successful that the Wall Street Journal ran a, a special edition just on the um, success of the program. Well, headlines are very short, right? You know, JFK shot, Titanic sinks. Uh, you know, the, the entire story is told in those two, three, or four words. So we have to take this this word salad and, and uh, distill it down to that headline. So they get their headline. And of course, every headline has uh, is supported by articles. So we identify up to four articles that are going to directly uh, align to that headline. So for instance, uh, icebergs reported in the North Atlantic might be an article for Titanic sinks. And then you have three factoids associated with that article. And the factoids are going to turn into either the KPIs or the OKRs. So when you're done with this exercise, which this exercise will take no longer than a day, never has anyway. Mm -hmm. um, when you're done with the exercise, you know what your success criterion is. You know what is important and what's not important. You have your, uh, your major indicators that support your program. You have your KPIs and your OKRs. And you're basically, you know, uh, constituted your program. Now you have to just, you know, work on, on doing it. So does that make sense? So if you're yeah, looking at yeah. this, a person does not need to know anything other than their role in the company, what they think um, the aspirations are, uh, you know, debating and distilling out that, in, you know, collecting and then debating and distilling out uh, the information, basically processing it. So mm -hmm. if you look at this, and, you know, when I went to university, I you know, started with uh, computer programming. I look at this and I look at this as a computer program. You know, we're harvesting information, we're processing information, we're sorting it, we're pushing it, we're pulling it, massaging it, inferring it. And then at the end of the day, we've actually made a decision. And the decision isn't to have a, another meeting about it. The decision is that we've made a decision. You know, we've decided on a course of action. Right. I love this because it involves everybody. Everything's out in the open. Uh, and if we go to uh, my friend Paul Rolkins, the high performance coach, uh, you know, teams guy out of out of the Netherlands, most people, executives and companies are not on the same page as to what we are doing and what's important. And so if you get them all to commit to that headline for once, <laughs> they're on the same page, right? As to right. like, what what is the goal here? What are we doing? Right. So I love right. that. So here's a, another one I'll show you real briefly. This is, again, remember, this is about a meter tall or three feet mm -hmm. tall. And this one goes on about uh, 24 feet. Mm -hmm. it's, a big, it's a big poster. Um, and in this one, we're talking about create, uh, converting a vision into a reality. So what is a vision we start off with? And, and for those people in lean, you know, we talk about people, processes, and technology. And we have, you know, one year, two year and five year buckets. So, you know, what are we doing as a company with our people? Are we hiring or beefing up? Are we, you know, reconstituting a department? Um, are, are we training? What about our processes? What are we doing with our processes? What are we doing with our technology? And by the way, while we're doing all of this, the market is doing its own thing. I mean, the market isn't just your competitors. You know, the market could be, what is the supply chain going to do? Uh, what are uh, what about geopolitics? How's that going to influ influence our planning? Uh, what about um, uh, economics? How's that going to influence our planning? And again, we're going, you know, we're collecting this information, and then we're in this particular game. We're looking at um, uh, uh, four focus areas in in the company, and we're looking at you know uh, fantastic ideas. We're harvesting them. We're the no brainers, the the wise choices. Uh, this is uh, no brainers or, you know, short term and high impact. And then we from that, we pick each one of these focus groups. We pick a uh, idea. I like to have a, a regular idea and then I like to have a, a crazy idea. <laughs> these are the ideas that people think about, mm -hmm. but sometimes are, are, are afraid to share because they're so like, you know, they, they might sound crazy. And then in this case, we uh, everybody's given sticky money. 
and they pick how much they would like to invest in each of these ideas. Okay. It's basically a ranking system. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, you know, how do we uh, uh, prioritize and where does it fit on the short term, long term? Which ones are logistics? Logistics being things that you buy, whether it's talent or apparatus or whatever it is. Tactical, these are, you know, things that are, 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 are uh, plans, uh, you know, that uh, support strategies. Uh, and then, of course, there's strategic, which is, you know, those big hairy goals and, and aspirations that companies have. Mm -hmm. So this is another, you know, simple game board. I um, love that there's the spot for the crazy ideas. Uh, yeah. you know, they're already labeled as such. And so like, there's no fear in bringing that out. Right. And yet that could be the most transformative thing of all. Yeah. So I, I other mean, people get to see it. Or like you might find somebody else in the organization who's been like, oh yeah, I've been thinking about something like that, but I've been too afraid to say it. You've been thinking about that too? Wow. You know, and <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, uh, you know, uh, the gentleman at Kodak that invented digital photography. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, that's a crazy idea. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, Kodak was a chemical a company yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that, you know, they had billions of dollars worth of assets invested in processing chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know, even if they recognized uh, the the power, the transformational power of digital photography. I don't know if they could have still avoided bankruptcy um, mm -hmm. because they had all those assets all over the world to process the chemicals. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, the real super sauce, the real secret sauce, I should say, is in the way these boards are created. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, remember, I, I said that this is sort of like a game, a, a program. And this program has logical elements all right each one of these is like a subroutine in your program and there's a, a gigantic library of of logical elements that we've created but to put this together and this is a really um, amazing piece is that you don't have to be an adobe illustrator expert to create it i'm not i'm like you know joe paris i'm a, you know almost a computer neanderthal i would never be able to get into a, a adobe uh illustrator but everybody knows powerpoint so if you think about this, this is all done in PowerPoint. Okay. Now, why is that important? Because in PowerPoint, which most everybody knows how to use, um, if I wanted to change these questions, if I wanted to change the colors to my own corporate colors, I could do that. If I wanted to change the, the questions, I can do that. Um, if I wanted to re or reprogram it, you know, these being uh, logical elements, I could just uh, highlight it and move it and insert other logical elements. Mm -hmm. So I'm just reconstituting the program and how I'm collecting, uh, pushing, pulling, processing this, this, this data. Um, and uh, when you're done, we create a big JPEG. Now it's a big high res vector JPEG because uh, you, know, you can't just do a, a, a one that's it's out of PowerPoint because it wouldn't scale. You would, I mean, it would look fuzzy. It'd look like crap on the wall. Um, so by using uh, converting it to uh, uh, vectors and uh, doing a high uh, res JPEG, then we could print it out, you know, three foot tall and however wide and, and it works. Mm -hmm. And so you are leading people through uh, this process in, in live workshops. Yeah, there's there's a couple of ways we we engage um, uh, clients. First off, uh, you know, oftentimes we're just called uh, in and uh, they describe the challenge that they uh, have, mm -hmm. and we'll either uh, use one of our pre-developed uh, approaches, methods, uh, game boards, if you will, uh, or we'll modify an existing, or we'll create one from scratch. Remember, it's a program, so we have to figure out, you know. What is the mm -hmm. nature of the problem that is being solved? And what is the answer that we're trying to, to get to? Uh, and then we have to create a, a series of, of, or organize a series of logical elements to support that outcome. And we, of course, don't know what that outcome is going to be because as moderators, you know, I'm not passing judgment on the quality or uh, of the data uh, or the information or the collaboration. I don't know where the conversation is going to go, except that it's going to go eventually to a conclusion. But how it gets there and what form it takes, 
Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that. Uh, and usually the person that's in hiring us to, to perform this workshop also doesn't know it, which is why they're hiring us. Um, another thing that we do is there's companies and there's also consultants out there that want to use this methodology in their engagements for their own companies or for their clients. And so we also train people on the methodology. It's a three, three day training course. It's very, very intense. There's, you know, very limited people uh, allowed in usually between 12 and 16 people are allowed to take the course at any given time. It could be one company. It could be multiple companies, you know, open enrollment, if you will. But what we'll do is we'll take them through uh, design thinking, operational excellence, design thinking for operational excellence. We'll show them the uh, logical elements how they're put together, how to actually successfully moderate one of these workshops mm. in a problem-solving environment, the technology that's involved uh, in uh, the actual delivery of a workshop, uh, the recordings that are, are uh, and transcriptions that are uh, that occur, uh, also the after-action documentation and how that, um, uh, uh, what form that takes. So there's a, it's it's high touch, pretty intense training for three days. Okay. So, so a company can call you in for a custom run through of this, where you're designing the process and putting these assets together, right. To create a logical flow. Uh, and then they're going to get this visual thing that they're going to interact with and their team's going to get, um, an right. outcome on, which is very cool. <clears throat> Another alternative is you're going to have uh, a workshop in say Miami or Chicago or something like that, where, one, two, three, four people from different companies can go to a maximum of like 16 people and learn how to use this stuff with sample projects, example projects, I guess. Yeah, um, uh, what we do is, uh, in fact, I, I one of the, the, the exercises I use is this same uh, game board here, mm -hmm. but I modify it to plan a vacation. Mm. Okay, because okay. you know, if you have... 12 people from a different companies, mm. you know, what is a common problem that everybody could work on? Mm. So I just say, let's pretend we're one big family and we're organizing a family reunion, a vacation. Um, <clears throat> let's go through the process. And there's okay. things like, okay, uh, what's the budget? And everybody you know, will identify what their normal budget would be. How long is it going to be? Where they're going to go? What are they going to do? And so we're still answering, you know, these eight questions or different eight questions and seeking alignment and seeking uh, to come up with a collaborative uh, solution at the end that we're going to go here. We're going to do this. This is where we're going to stay. This is how we're going to get there and back um, and, and so on and so forth. So that's a, a run through that uh, we do. Uh, for everybody in a mixed uh, mode environment, mixed company environment. Of course, if it was just a single company that was being trained, then we could actually work on spe uh, uh, challenges specific to that organization. Uh, however, we also uh, break up into teams and the teams are given a challenge and then they have to create the logical program to support uh, that challenge. And everybody then is able to compare and contrast each person's approaches um, uh, and uh, deliver a moderated workshop. Okay. Very, very cool. Yeah. So there's no confidential information being passed back and forth in the, in the open groups, right? It's, it's yeah, an well, example project. They're learning how to use it. Are they getting yeah. these assets to take back to their. That's a great question. Uh, they get uh, um, a couple of these pre can templates, but they, more importantly, they do get, um, all of the logical elements so they can construct their own journeys. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. So I see this as an extremely powerful tool, um, not just for understanding the problem, but for getting people on the same side, which is yeah. the hardest thing of all sometimes. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in many meetings where uh, I've pulled together executives from the company who are rarely in the same room, even virtually. And, uh, They've been talking past each other, possibly for years. Right. And and uh, with an exercise like this, uh, they're going to get on the same page. And that right. is yeah, super, super powerful. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> How do we stop the share here? Uh, we click on stop sharing. Um, ah, okay. Oh, there it is. I got I it. I can turn here. it off for you. I got it. Yeah. Um, talk to us about the after action report. You, you touched on that, but I want to hear more about it because they're going to walk away with something. Um, 
that yeah, the, is a the, document it transcribes the uh okay. the sticky it's, notes right so there's there this is a, a job for the moderator but there's also um involvement with technology so remember this poster is big all right mm -hmm. and so what we do is we put some uh, uh microphones bluetooth microphones on the poster um and we have uh, a teams meeting running with the camera uh, so we're uh, capturing real time. And that, this is not just for our training, but this is how you deliver one of these workshops on your own. Uh, so what we're doing, the moderator is, you know, calling up the individuals. Uh, the individual have this little, you know, post-it note with some writings on it. The contributor of the poster note will put it on the board and talk about their post-it note. You know, what is it uh, and what's its meaning, you know, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, if I look at that post-it note two or three days from now, I might not be able to read it. Certainly, I forget the context, all right? So what we're doing with Teams is, and the microphones is we're capturing what's going on, mm. and it's transcribing what is being said and, be, and capturing that. And the moderator will then uh, assign a number out loud and write it on the mm. post-it note. So this is post-it num number four. So later on, when you're looking through the transcription, you could say, okay, this is post-it number four. This is what the post-it actually is because we have, you know, uh, photographs that we're taking mm -hmm. at, uh, afterwards. Um, this is uh, this is the, the image of the post-it note. This is what was said, um, and then the consultant or the, the workshop moderator or whomever is responsible for um, evaluating uh, the goings-on of the workshop will then make their analysis and recommendations, but. Um, they don't have to be involved in uh, the rather time-consuming process of cutting and pasting text in the the post-it notes because you know an uh, administrative person can can do that or uh, hopefully uh, perhaps even AI eventually could be figured out how to do that you know read the read the the uh, um, uh, transcript put it into its proper place mm -hmm. you know identify the uh, the post-it number the numbers. And, and so yeah. forth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the reason yeah. for that, though, is because sometimes, even though a decision's been made, acting on that decision might take some time, and mm -hmm. the people that were involved in making the decision may or may not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. So now we've memorialized uh, uh, the goings on. Okay. So it's not just yeah, I might forget what was said or whatever. Right. I like that the context is not lost, right? That is right. retained and put in there, and then uh, yeah, down the road, even people who weren't involved. In that, right. in that decision can right. pick up on oh that's what they meant okay exactly so, without right. having to do any real crazy archaeological work <laughs> right exactly <laughs> right cover. and and you know in fact since the whole thing is recorded mm -hmm. um a a new newly introduced person to the process can actually see the recorded uh workshop hmm. if they're mm -hmm. inclined good good so yeah and this is all done in in a day that's yeah the, Really, really I've powerful. never had one of these uh, workshops take more than a day. Usually they're about four or five hours. Uh, it depends on the level of complexity. You know, the, the vision to a reality that could take all day. You mm -hmm. know, um, it won't take any more than all day, but it'll, it, it could take all day. This one here with the OPEX, uh, defining an OPEX program, uh, that usually mm -hmm. takes four or five hours, believe it or not. Uh, you know, people are saying, well, what's our OPEX program? And they'll obsess over it for, <laughs> for months and they won't be able to figure it out. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're you know wondering, how did we, how did that all come together? We must have missed something because, it, you know, mm. it doesn't it's take fast. so long. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. too fast. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So how can people find out more about this? Uh, and I know the investment, I'm not going to tie us down to a specific price because it could change as time goes right. on. In my opinion, the value is at least 10 times what the investment, like you could charge 10 times what you're charging in my opinion. Yeah, I, and the know, value would yeah. still be 10 times beyond that at least. Um, yeah. And so for an organization of any size, this is, this is tremendous. Yeah. So, um, you know, at, at the Zonatech website, we have a couple of uh, web pages uh, devoted to design thinking for operational excellence. Uh, Zonatech is uh, X O N I T E K dot com. But there's a couple of uh, pages. One is for the moderator training. So, if you want to learn how to become a moderator, um, there's a, a page devoted to that and what's all involved and, and what people should expect. And the other page is just on design thinking and the pre canned. Um, 
uh, workshops we've already created, you know, uh, what, what it accomplishes, who's the intended audience and so forth and so on. And then of course we, you know, periodically uh, schedule these open enrollment, uh, design thinking for operational excellence, moderator training and certification, uh, programs. Right. And in that case, if you're interested in that, you should come and talk to me, uh, because I can get you a discount code for that. And, uh, That'll be nice. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> Never hurts at all. Yeah. Always all right, happy to help your yeah. audience. You do some great stuff. <laughs> right. Thanks. All right, Joseph. Did we did we miss anything? Is there anything that we should cover that we haven't? I think we, we covered it pretty uh, pretty pretty well. I mean, there's always something we could talk about in addition to, but I you yeah. know, if, I think that we hit all the high points and uh uh, you know, your audience uh, can can contact you or yeah. or myself or you know, if they want to learn more. And right. uh, you know, uh, hope uh, hope everybody gets into design thinking. The, the, right. the real power is yeah. that you you could be a layperson. You could just be a guy off the street or a gal off the street and just start engaging. You don't mm -hmm. have to learn anything. Right. I love that. And uh, the seeing seeing is believing. It really. <laughs> In this case, especially. So if you're listening to this uh, on the audio, check out the description and I'll have links in there to Google Drive uh, folder, still images and uh, links to the Zona Tech website and also to talk to me if that's what you want uh, to get more info on. JP, thanks for doing this. My I'm pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm going to mention your great book, State of Readiness, in the outro. <laughs> People <laughs> should go and check that out. Uh, best book I've read on OPEX in, in 20 plus years. Uh, really changed well, thanks. Me. Thanks, yeah. Jason. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, I really appreciate it. Very good. Speak soon. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look at Zonatech's design thinking methodology workshop. And if you're interested in attending a workshop or getting personalized in-house training by Zonatech on this thing, let me know. Reach out because I can get you preferred pricing on it as a partner. And let's have a conversation about it. Thanks for listening.